Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, delighted to continue our parade of expert witnesses here, uh, launching the second half of the course uh, and our move to more concrete uh, contemporary case studies. Uh, we have with us today Mal Salter. Mal Salter is a graduate of Harvard College from 1962-ish. Uh, he then uh, went across the river uh, to Harvard Business School and never left since, uh, where he taught for many years at Harvard Business School, uh, eventually becoming let me get this straight, the James J. Hill Professor of Business Administration, now Emeritus. Um, and although he has this uh, outstanding academic history and career, uh, the truth is he actually did leave a bit. He was a founding partner of Mars & Company, a uh, global consulting firm uh, that has a number of, of uh, illustrious and luminous uh, business leaders that came out of that. And Mao was there from the beginning and had this long career in consulting, working with some of the largest companies domestically and around the globe. So he's also had this insider practitioner's perspective uh, on the private sector. And uh, most recently, one of his uh, most significant books of the last 10 years, uh, you may have seen, it's called Innovation Corrupted, The Origins and Legacy of Enron's Collapse. Uh, Mao was one of the, the people positioned to kind of do the forensic uh, investigation after Enron to understand what went wrong and what lessons should we draw from it. Uh, one reason we wanted to have him kick off our uh, sort of three session focus on economics is precisely because of the work he's done at the intersection of, of theory and practice in economics. Um, coming in, to, we talked a lot in the first half of the course about political institutions. Um, what are the incentives at play there? How does money uh, maybe influence politics? But here we come to a domain where the economics is primary. Business is about making profits. And um, at first glance, markets are all about aligning incentives in mutually productive ways. Uh, this is the uh, idea of the kind of indivis in invisible hand that we actually have it in everybody's interest to do something productive uh, for other people and be able to make profit off that. Um, but as our institutional economists have hinted, um, the actual arrangement of incentives on the ground is going to be mediated through various sorts of institutions, various sorts of laws, so that even under our understanding of the private sector, uh, is going to be more complex and we're going to have to do a lot of work to understand what are the arrangements of current incentives and how, how might we think of making them better in various pockets of the economy and private sector. So without further ado, um, Al's going to talk today about institutional corruption in the private sector, what is it and what to do about it. Can you hear me now? Is it on? Yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming uh, and for the conversation that we will, that we will have. Uh, when I got up this morning and, and looked at my slides that I'd put together uh, a few days ago, one thing that struck me about the title was how totally arrogant it was. You know, you know institutional corruption uh, in the private sector, what is it and what to do about it. And I didn't like that title, so I'm going to give it a different title. And uh, the title I'd like to give it is Ethical Reasoning 52. Uh, for some reason, the title of this course is Ethical Reasoning 36. I don't know what 36 relates to at all. But 52 uh, relates to the 52 years that I've actually been trying to think about issues of, uh, uh, that involve ethical uh, reasoning. And I'll tell you why. So when I was an undergraduate here, I spent a lot of my time across the other side of Harvard Yard and Emerson uh, Hall, uh, where all the English classes uh, were, were taught. And I majored in English. And I majored in English because I, I liked reading novels. I liked reading biographies. I liked to write. And all my friends seemed to like to write. So that was why I majored in English. Uh, over in, in uh, across the way at Emerson, uh, which I visited just before I came here uh, uh, today, uh, I could still hear the voices of uh, the great Professor Walter Jackson Bate, who taught the great course on John Milton, which was probably the best course that I ever had at Harvard. I could hear the, the, the voices of uh, Professor Harry Levin and Shakespeare, and I could hear the voices of uh, Professor Perry Miller, who taught American Transcendental Literature. Uh, Perry Miller was a terrific uh, lecturer, whether he was hungover or tipsy. Uh, he had an affinity for the bottle, which we all knew, and it didn't matter because he was great. Uh, but uh, one, of the things that was, one of the things that was great for all of these courses were all these courses had to do intensely with moral deliberation. 
And so when I left to go uh, uh, from being an English major at Harvard College to going to the Harvard Business School, and I'll tell you how I got in there in a minute, uh, I, um, I was sensitized to issues of moral deliberation because that's what I was writing papers about and that's what I was reading about as an English major. And when I left to go across the river in 1962, of course, there were the famous Kefauver hearings. Uh, Senator Estes Kefauver, a senator from, uh, from, uh, from Tennessee, ended up getting famous for these hearings on crime and, uh, and the pharmaceutical industry and price fixing and so forth. He ended up being the presidential nominee uh, with Adlai Stevenson in the 1956 election, uh, lost to uh, Eisenhower and Nixon. He was probably the most intellectual <laughs> candidate for president since Teddy Roosevelt. So, but when I was going across the river, what was interesting, the, the, the Kefauver Commission came out with a report. Uh, I actually looked it up, and I have it on my iPhone, but I'm not going to take the time to read some of the conclusions. But the conclusions of that report are just what the conclusions are today. It has to do with the profitability of pharmaceutical companies. It has to do with advertising. It has to do with pricing. It has to do with conflicts of interest. It has to do with a variety of things back in the uh, early 1950s that we're still discussing in the SAFRA, in the SAFRA Senate. So I was sensitized, you know, uh, to, to all of this. And I've been trying to think about it for a long, for a long period of time. And, uh, and I was particularly sensitized to it because the way I got into the Harvard Business School, I'm sure, was that unbeknownst to all my friends uh, as undergraduates, I was, a, I was actually a stock trader on Wall Street during the summer. Uh, and I traded stocks. And I can tell you what stocks they were that I traded. Uh, nobody knew about this. Uh, nobody knew, except for my roommates and a few teammates, uh, you know, uh, knew about that because uh, uh, this was, of course, I think uh, appropriately so in the 1950s and 60s, a very liberal university, still is, and I think that's a great thing. But more importantly, if, uh, if, if any of my friends at Radcliffe College, which was still Radcliffe College at that time, knew that I had been a, a stock trader, I never would have gotten a date. Uh, it, would, it, was, it was just not de rigueur. It was really very, very, uh, it was really off. But I saw a lot of stuff down there that made me very sensitive to these kinds of issues, and I've been thinking about them for a long time. So this sounds like an arrogant title to me. So ethical reasoning is 52. And now, all this history may imply that I have the answer to one of society's most uh, intractable, pernicious uh, problems, which is the problem of institutional uh, corruption, particularly in the private sector. And I do not have that answer, I'm sorry to tell you, after 52 years of trying to uh, think about it. I have a partial answer. I'd like to share that partial answer with you, discuss it you know, with you today. So all I can really promise is sort of one approach to mitigating or curbing the curse, uh, if you will, of institutional corruption uh, in the private sector. And then after this partial treatment, I want to leave you kind of with a question to chew on. Uh, maybe we can involve Professor Le uh, Lessig on this as well uh, later on, but I always believe in a pedagogy of questions. I think that ending with a question is much more powerful than ending with a conclusion. Uh, uh, now, uh, I have not dumbed down this talk, okay? Uh, this is precisely the kind of talk which I am going to give uh, to, uh, to colleagues of mine uh, in the weeks that, that come forward uh, in the business community. But I am hoping to fulfill Einstein's famous advice to his colleagues in physics, which was everything should be kept as simple as possible, but no simpler. So that's sort of what I'm, that's kind of the tone I, I hope to have for uh, today. For those of you who read the problem, this talk uh, may provide some useful accent strokes and clarifications. For those of you who have not read the paper, this talk will hopefully help set your, uh, your intellectual compass, you know, when you finally, when you finally get to it. Uh, what my uh, agenda is, uh, first I want to talk a little bit uh, about why institutional corruption uh, matters to me personally and why I've been sort of, I have been, uh, I've been kind of chewing this uh, for, for some time. Uh, uh, I want to give you some definitions of what I'm talking about, you know, in terms of institutional corruption. I'm sure a lot of this will be familiar to you. Uh, I want to talk about one uh, special form of institutional corruption in the private sector. You've been talking about it in the public sector, I know, from Bill which is this whole question of gaming. I want to talk a little bit about gaming. Uh, I want to talk about how short-termism invites corruption, which is the title of the, uh, of the paper. 
And, uh, and then how do you curb it? How do you think about curbing short-termism and the kind of corruption it invites, such as, such as gaming? And I'm going to talk a little bit about playing the long game, what I call playing the long game. What is the long game? Uh, and the question is, what are the objectives of this game? And what are the essential business and public policies that are required in, pl in, paying, in playing uh, uh, this, uh, this game? So the question then is, why does institutional corruption uh, matter? And one of the things, as a, as a student of, of, of history as well as of literature, one of it seems to the great lessons of history, it seems to me, is that each civilization has within itself the seeds of not only its own uh, change, but its own destruction. And uh, if you go back, and of course, the person who first introduced me to this idea was Arnold J. Toynbee, who is a professor of history at Balliol College, Oxford, Oxford historian. He wrote, the, he wrote the, uh, the study of history. He studied 21 civilizations. He wrote 12 volumes from 1936 to 1960. So I was kind of a sophomore or a junior when his last book came out uh, over a 28-year period. I can remember rushing to get his last book and reading it. It was all very exciting for those of us who were interested in civilizations. Others have done this, too, in different ways. Uh, Manson, uh, Mancour Olson, The Rise and Decline of Nations in 1982 basically wrote about parochial cartels and lobbies and how they tend to accumulate power over time until they sap the, the nation's uh, uh, vitality. And the preservation and renewal requires that, 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 that a nation's people rise up and kind of push off this parochialism, which basically lead, would lead unattended to, to its own destruction. Another book that's just out, which I recommend to everybody in this course, and I recommend it to everybody I meet on the street, is uh, Esamoglu and Johnson's book, Why Nations Fail. Uh, Esamoglu is at MIT. Johnson is in the political science department uh, here. Uh, and this is about, this is basically, uh, it, it, it so much re relates to what, if anyone wants to do a good report for this course, go read that book. It's great because he basically writes about how, going through civilization after civilization, the development of exclusionary institutions basically leads to the downfall of these institutions. And when you think about Congress, you think about the things that Professor Lessig has been reading, has been writing about and living, this is very much uh, uh, relates to that. Now, one of the things that is sort of a keynote of my thinking about why it matters, is this famous sort of c conclusion from Arnold Toynbee in the study of history, which is that civilizations die by suicide, not by murder. Okay, we do it to ourselves. We are doing it to ourselves. And, uh, and I think that, uh, and, and sometimes we're doing it to ourselves without knowing it, and sometimes there are a few knaves involved. You know, at the uh, you know at the, uh, at the at the same uh, at the same time. Now, when we think of civilizations, they uh, tend to be, and they always are, I think, identified by some mode of thought of organizing principles. And these are typically expressed in society's art, its music, its literature, its systems of ethics. But but civilizations are also fundamentally defined by their social and political relationships and by their systems of economic and political, political governance. And uh, so the question then becomes, what does institutional corruption have to do with the breakdown of civilizations? And my view on this is that institutional corruption compromises these organizing principles and values of what we experience as a civilization. And the US, our most fundamental organizing principles and values are expressed by our systems of political and economic governance. And they're related. And you know what they are. Our system of political governance is democracy. And our system of economic governance is capitalism. And in a country that basically is built around democratic capitalism, they're all together. One of the things that's important, I think, about this course and why I'm delighted to be here today, if you go through the catalog of, of, uh, of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and you look at the number of courses that are actually looking at the current state of democracy and capitalism, they're very few. This is a course that's doing it. And this is really, to me, at the core of where we are in trying, thinking about what kind of a civilization we want going forward. So it's a big deal issue. It's a big deal issue. For example, you might ask, how does institutional corruption compromise US capitalism? 
Well, US capitalism offers much to celebrate. I am, and certainly at the center, my role at the center is to be the sort of what, the happy capitalist? Yeah, I guess that's it. You know, I, I, I'm it, and I'm, 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 I'm very much of that. And, but it has delivered high levels of average incomes and important economic uh, freedoms, but our system of economic governance is now compromised. It's compromised by unequal distribution of personal incomes. I want to talk about that in a minute. Continuing shortage of attractive employment opportunities. There's, there have been a lot of studies in upward mobility that shows we're even below Europe, which is in the sink, you know, in many respects, e e economically, with comparatively low odds of escaping policy. And we have ethical drift that we can talk about. And of course, we have declining public trust in the leading institutions of business, which I am going to, uh, which I'm going to get back to in just, uh, in just a moment. Uh, trust is very important, I want to point out. Uh, and, and this is trust, the public's trust to the institution's ability to achieve its goals and to serve the public interest in some way. I don't know if you picked that up in Bill's introductory comment, but he said something very interesting in his comment that I thought was right on, which has to do with the balance between the profitability of the public interest. We tend to forget that. And if you go back, the best statesman of that was Teddy Roosevelt, 1900, when he was taking on the trusts, the big trusts. And as governor of New York, he gave this great speech uh, in 1900 about the trusts to the, to the legislature in Albany. And as he said, we do not desire to destroy corporations. We desire to put them at the service of the state and the people. Don't forget, corporations are chartered by the state. They're protected by the state. There's a quid pro quo. We can't forget that. So uh, that's, that's, on the, that's on the capitalism side. But also, you might ask, how is institutional corruption compromising US democracy, another key part of our civilization? Well, this is very close to my heart, because in the last 50 or 55 years, US democracy has changed enormously, just in my, in my lifetime. We have a more uh, open and transparent society since the 1980s. And most importantly, there's the elimination of state-tolerated racial segregation throughout the country. This is probably the biggest event in my life, OK, over the last 50, uh, 50 years. But our system of political governance is compromised by all the things that you've been talking about here, you know, up to, uh, up to now in this course, and also declining public trust in, uh, in, in, in government. Uh, now, you might ask. Oh, well, this is all well and good, Salter, but uh, is this an alarmist view? I mean, aren't you kind of going overboard here a bit? You know, aren't you kind of making it larger than it is? And I don't know. I, like to, I don't know what you think about this. I'd be very interesting. Is US capitalism and democracy at peril? Has institutional corruption actually increased in recent decades? Or could it be that our expectations for public and private conduct have simply changed? I asked this at my 50th reunion two years ago, to, uh, at uh, which we organized around corruption. And, uh, and Professor Legas gave the, uh, gave the opening, uh, opening speech, uh, which was really quite interesting, since even my most conservative banking friends stood up and applauded their hands off. So I thought that was really quite good. But has this changed? And, and our class basically said, yeah, our expectations have changed over a, a period of time. Or is it that we've just become more proficient uh, in revealing longstanding and corrupt practices? Maybe we just get better reporting. We have better people in the, newspaper, in, in, in the media now you know, reporting out. Uh, was there ever a golden age without corruption? These are all very valid you know, questions to have. And, and, uh, and it's, it's useful just to think for a moment, what could have possibly have changed? You know, what's changed here? I don't know. Does anybody have a sense? Does anybody have a sense for what might have changed? I mean, there's been corruption since Rome. And before that, what's, what's kind of changing? Why is this kind of in the air now? What is it that's, that's kind of driving this right now? Uh, why are people like me, and maybe you, uh, sort of concerned about, about corruption in the private sector? Has anything changed that brings it out into the, into the foreground? <coughs> any hunches on this? Any of you have any feelings for what might be bringing it out? Yeah. And what's the it? Uh, corruption itself. 
Corruption? What kind of corruption? Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's more public. Yeah. Um, profits have increased astronomically. Yeah, profits have increased. Uh, 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 yeah, certainly in some industries, it's uneven. What else has increased astronomically? The Pardon me. The speculative, market. speculative market. Yes, I'm going to come back to that. It's a very important point as 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 well. Anything else has increased? Yeah. And maybe CEOs too. Yeah. And maybe maybe CEOs too. Okay, that could be an issue. Anything? Yes. Anything? Technology is huge right now. That it's just a, more people tend to talk with each other about these issues. Conversation is broader. Conversation is much broader than it's than it's been. A lot of good reasons. Yeah. Anything else? So that's quite interesting, actually, which is that uh, to make a profit today means that you might have to uh, take something away from somebody else, I think is what you're saying, rather than creating value, you're sort of capturing value from somebody. That could be a part. Anything else? A lot of good reasons. What else? I think all these are true. I think these are all true, and I think that's why there's a lot of interest in, in this, and people are writing about it, and why it's so important. Uh, if I ask myself what, over my limited period of 52 years that I've been kind of worrying about these issues, what's changed, and to use the language of this course, uh, I think what has changed is I think the economy of incentives has changed in our economy. And some of you have sort of made comments that kind of relate, that relate, that relate to this uh, uh, as well. One other thing about, about what's happening today, in my opinion anyway, is there's more money involved and there's more income inequality. Uh, there are more real and perceived distances between insiders and outsiders, between haves and have-nots, between winners and losers you know, that we're, we're talking about here. And there are greater incentives within business organizations encouraging employees to cut corners, to compromise espoused values, and cheat. And I'm going to get into this in a, in a little while. And my own view is that from an external public view, there's nothing, by the way, more ideologically sensitive than pay. You take the average person out there, put your hand on their pulse, and start talking about pay. That pulse goes up. People get really angry or excited you know, about pay, whether it's a baseball contract or whether it's uh, some, uh, some executive, uh, some executive uh, bonus. And I know from years of systematic research and experience uh, that financial incentives uh, basically swamp all other all other organizational influences. They, establish, they, 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 they dominate established norms, formal codes of conduct, and espoused values. For example, I just happened to bring along with me today, uh, this is a wonderful book. Uh, it feels good. It's, it's on high priced paper. Just feel it, just, just feel the print. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Smell it. <laughs> Smells beautiful, does it? The smell of good paper? Yeah. yeah, isn't that? That's, wow! Isn't that wonderful? This is the code of conduct of Enron Corporation. <laughs> okay. You know, it made no difference. It made no difference because of the perverse incentives, extraordinarily perverse incentives, which are operating you know, within the company. If anybody wants to come up and touch and feel it, you can. Uh, that's, they're for sale at some price on the, on the, on the, on the internet. Uh, and, uh, and for these reasons, you know, the economy of incentives comprising uh, you know, social pay systems both within the firms and across the economy, I think is, is pivotal to any understanding of what's driving our current version 
of uh, institutional corruption in the private sector. And I just want to give you a little bit of data on that because it's always fun looking at data, okay? So if you look at the current economy of incentives, if you look at the average CEO pay of the S&P 500 versus the average pay per employee, in 1980 it was 40x and it's now 354x. Now, uh, that is uh, low uh, relative to uh, uh, Professor uh, Lucian Bedchuk's uh, calculations at the law school. Uh, it's high relating, relative to the Economic Policy Institute. And the reason why, it has to do with the technology of valuating options, exercise and unexercised stock options. But that, you can see that's generally right. And if you look at the ratio of average salary and bonuses of executives, not just CEOs to the average compensation per worker, you can see the relationship between Australia, Germany, and the U.S. It's really quite, uh, it's really quite, uh, really quite uh, different. Uh, just to give you on the CEO count, just to, uh, uh, just to uh, give you a sense of reality, okay, uh, the relationship at Oracle uh, is uh, 1,287 to 1. At GE is 491 to, uh, to 1, uh, a little bit above the 354. At AT&T, uh, at 339 to 1, and at Lockheed, uh, 315. So they're real companies in here for uh, 2012. I, I've, got these, uh, I've got these numbers. Uh, now, if you look at, uh, by the way, I should say, I want to get back to the question just to, as, a, as a footnote. When you talk about the economy of incentives, you got to talk about two things. You got to talk about form and level. Okay, form is how the money is paid, how it's figured out and paid, how the bonus, for example, is allocated, and the level. I happen to think that the form is much more important than the level up to some point. <laughs> okay, yeah, up to some point. So the form of how it is is really, is really, uh, is really important. I mean, for example, very few people in this country resent the fact that Bill Gates is the richest guy in the world. I mean, he created, you know, quite a thing. Okay? And he didn't take anything away from anybody else. Okay. Maybe, you know. Uh, <laughs> but here it's very important. If you look at a part of the economy in the sense of inflation adjusted, uh, in, in, in inflation-adjusted increase in mean after-tax income in the U.S., you can see that the, basically that the top 1% uh, from 1970 to 2005 went up 175%. The next 40% went up uh, just uh, uh, went up uh, uh, went up 40, uh, the next 79% went up 40%. So 40% versus 175%. Uh, this gets people a little bit, you know, upset. You know, uh, you know, about that during that period of time. But here's the most important fact of, to me of what's changed. That in fact, if you look at the total income of this top 1% of American households, it's actually over a period of time, it's a bathtub curve. In other words, if you look back in 1915, the top 1% was about 18% uh, of household income. Then from 1930 to 1970, it dropped to about 10%. It was a huge drop. And for a long period of time, it was a really long bathtub, okay, at, at the bottom. And then, and then starting in 2007, the year before the financial crisis, it was up to uh, 24%, which is like a third above what it was in the, you know, in the 1920s. So, but people are feeling in their gut actually maps you know, on the data, that something here on the economy incentives looks different this, uh, this, time, uh, this time around. Now, you can ask yourself, well, how could that be? How could this happen? I mean, how do you explain this? Nice facts, but what does it mean? Well, you know, there are a lot of things, uh, some of which you've discussed here. There could be some political factors, for example. Starting in the decade around 2000, Business groups employed 30 times as many Washington lobbyists as trade unions and six times as many lobbyists as labor 
consumer groups, and public interest lobbyists all combined. Something you've been talking about here. These are enormous numbers, okay? And from 1988 to 2010, business interests of trade groups spent $29 billion on lobbying compared to, this, I said billion, okay? Compared with 482.2 million for labor, which is a 60 to one you know, uh, ratio. So there may be some political factors here in terms of laws uh, and, and implementation of laws that serve certain groups better than others. But there are other explanations, globalization, the decline in US blue collar jobs, technological jobs, uh, uh, technological change, which rewards brain over brawn, uh, uh, superstar phenomenon, uh, the immigration of less educated workers, soaring executive pay, uh, less progressive taxation, uh, don't forget, since 1970, the highest marginal rate has dropped from 91% to 40%. Okay, uh, so uh, let's just take a look at investment banking. So I just want to tell you, uh, fasten your seat belts. So here's some numbers I put together a couple years ago, actually. This is kind of eye test, but I'll explain it to you very quickly. Okay. The important numbers to look at is this and this. These are the five largest investment banks uh, up prior to the financial crisis. And I've got their pre-tax income for all these banks. And there's Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Bear Stearns, and Lehman Brothers. And then I've got salaries and benefits. And I've got salaries and benefits uh, over here. Now, the total for all these five banks over the 10 years leading up to the financial crisis was $222 billion in salaries and wages that were paid out. That's with a B. Yeah? Is the left chart in millions and the right chart in thousands? Uh, well, it's all billions. You want to look right here. Okay, this is billions. This is, now if you look at the salaries and benefits, it's billions. Okay, which means that twice as much was paid out in salaries and, uh, and uh, benefits than pre-tax income during that period. Now you could say, well, now, is that unusual? Okay, well, we can think of companies with salaries and, with, where salaries and, uh, and benefits as a percent of pre-tax profits might be very, very high. The one that comes to mind would be Walmart. That, 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 that employs thousands, hundreds of thousands of employees, and you expect their, you expect their compensation costs to be very high relative to their income. We're not talking about hundreds of thousands of employees here. We're talking about a limited number of, uh, of executives at, the, at, the, at, at, at investment banks, which tends to show that investment banks, since they're all public, are basically publicly owned compensation systems, if you get the point. Uh, since the IPO of Goldman Sachs, the average annual stock sales, just stock sales per partner has been $24 million. Yep. I'm sorry, this is a stupid question, but what's the difference between salary and income? Between salary and income? Yeah. Okay, salary is what if, I, what, what, if you were for Goldman Sachs and I was the managing partner, I would pay you. It would be that plus some benefits, medical costs, and so medical insurance and stuff like that. Income is the corporate income. Okay, this is the uh, pre-tax income for the, for the institution itself. For the institution itself. Yeah, so thanks for that. Okay. So uh, there's a lot else going on here, but this is an economy of incentives, which is part of the data set. Let me put it that way, if I can say that. It explains what's going on. Uh, social comparison, we don't have to spend too much time on this. This is with how, how b banking partners deal with hedge fund managers. 2001 to 2007, uh, you know, so you got George Sor uh, Soros made $6 billion. Uh, John Polson, who's a former student of mine, just under $4 billion. Really smart guy. He bet against, you know, these, the, uh, the housing crisis and won. Made $4 billion in, in, in one trade that took, I don't know, three or four years to execute. So you can see what kind of money we're talking about here. By the way, just as a as a just as as a uh, as a as a quick uh, as a as a quick reminder, uh, 
Since 2008, there are only two really investment banks left. The other ones have, been, have either collapsed, like Lehman Brothers, or been sold. Uh, Bear Stearns to J.P. Morgan and Merrill Lynch to Bank of America. Actually, the relationships now are, uh, are, quite, are quite different. If you look at salaries and benefit, compensation and benefits relative to profitability, it's, it's, it's certainly not two to one you know, for Goldman. Then you look at Morgan Stanley, which is 73 to, let's go back here, to, uh, to 15. Now, that's kind of like five to one. What do you think is going on there? That's incredible. It's gone up. Since the crisis, it's gone up. What could possibly be going on? Well, because uh, this, uh, these numbers here, uh, excuse me, these numbers here, the, the pre-tax income, basically is after you deduct, you know, after you deduct the compensation benefits. I'm just using it as a denominator, just to, as a, as to normalize it in some way. Okay. Good question. So that, that's profit, not. Yeah, yeah, that's profit. Yeah. So, so what could possibly be happening here? Well, what we know is happening here is that obviously Morgan Stanley <coughs> is scared baloney. That these guys, that their people, that their executives are going to defect, so they're overpaying. They're overpaying them to keep them to keep them on board, okay? And that leads to the kind of that leads to the kind of uh, 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 excesses, you know, that we're looking at here. I've got some more information on CEOs. I don't want to go into that right now. I'll spend time on that. But what's happening? What's happening to all this pay? What's driving everything on this? And what's driving it all? are stock options. Does everybody know what a stock option is? You don't know what a stock option is. OK. So if you're working for me, OK, in a public company, what's your name? I'm sorry, I don't know. Stefan. Stefan. Yeah. OK, Stefan, great. That's my middle name. So we're buddies. OK. <laughs> OK, Stefan. So you're working for me, OK? So I'm going to pay you a salary. I'm going to pay you maybe a bonus, OK, based on performance. And I'm going to pay you some stock. You know, different kinds of stock. I'm not going to go into that. And what that stock basically says is, what that stock, I'll give you a, some stock option, which means that you can't exercise it. In other words, you can't you know, exercise it and sell it for maybe 18 months or two years, OK? And, uh, and so then the question is, if you haven't sold it yet, and you have a possibility of selling it two years in the future, what's the value of that option? If no transaction, it's only a gift, but there's been no transaction, what's the value of that option? Well, economists have gotten Nobels you know, for figuring this out. And there are ways of, figuring, of valuing those options that haven't been yet, that haven't been yet traded. But then, then you sell it at whatever time, and you, you, pay your taxes, you pay your taxes on it and do what you want with it at that, at that point. So that becomes cash at that point. So what an option is, is a right you know, to own the stock and then sell it at some time in the future. It's a, piece of the, it's a piece of the puzzle. But you can see what happened that this is equity-based pay has gone up you know, since the 90s you know, in, in, in an extraordinary way, such that 92% of all public companies were heavily involved in stock options. That's gone down because the tax law has changed in some way I won't go into at this point. But that is, and as the, we've been in an enormous bull market, so executive compensation has just gone way up with, as the stock options have become part of paying you know, executives. Now, how does this relate to institutional corruption? Well, equity-based pay remains high for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which it supposedly sort of gets synthesis between the interests of managers and the uh, and, and stock, and interests of stockholders. It means they're both interested in the same things. You would say, well, why wouldn't they be interested in the same things? After all, the shareholders hire these guys. Well, the reason that, the reason that they're not always the same interest is what economists call agency costs. That is, the principal, which is the owners of the stock, and the agents are the people who basically run the company you know, for the shareholders. Their interests aren't necessarily collateral, are, the sa are not sa necessarily identical because we all have motives that are slightly different. I'll give you a case in point. Mothers are usually not perfect agents for their kids after the kids are four years old. 
And as kids get older, as we get, I know that, <laughs> and as we get older and older and older, you know, that, you know, parents speak less and less for their kids, you know, fathers too. And so there's this difference, and what they try to do is get, this, get the incentives aligned between the, the owners and the managers, and uh, so there'll be a, a, a narrower gap between the interests of the two, and that's what supposedly these stock options, that's, the, that's sort of the mythology of the, of the, stock, of the stock options. But the, so that's great, but guess what with all these options, and this gets back to corruption, if you've got options, Stefan, you're loaded up with options. And let's say your options are 10 times your salary, 10 times your salary. And you can exercise those options in two years. And let's say you've got, design, you've got, you've got, uh, you've got decision rights, serious decision rights within the organization. What's your instinct to be as how you run the company? You've got to cash out in two years. Why should you do now? You're going to get a big bundle in two years. You could get a big bundle in two years, which is 10 times your salary. You can cash out in two years. How are you going to act? Maybe I'll cash out. When? In two years. And what are you going to do until the two years? Just keep working. Keep what? Keep working. Keep working to do what? Like further the company's value. Yes! Of course you are! <laughs> That's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to boost. You're going to boost the stock price, right? right? Everything you can do to get the stock price up. Now, between you and me, how many ways are there to increase the stock price of a company? I don't know. Any number of ways. Any number. Hundreds. Okay. There are hundreds of ways. <laughs> I'm pulling apart. Okay. There are hundreds of ways. There are hundreds of ways to do that. And what that can do, particularly if your window, you know, is two years. That's short-termism, and that invites all different kinds of corruption. This is why the incentive system exchanges are so, uh, are so important. OK, it's important. So, uh, and what's different this time around, you know, is that the economy of senators might be, might be different. But look, what are we really talking about uh, here? Corruption matters. Its expression may be different from earlier you know, uh, expressions of institutional corruption. But we face two questions. What does it actually mean? What does institutional corruption actually mean in the private sector? And what do we do about it? And I want to tell you, this is not an easy task to answer these questions. Because as I'm sure you've discussed here with, uh, with, your, with, with Professor Lege, Lessig and, and, and Bill, that many allegedly corrupt behaviors involve ambiguous legal or even desirable activities that are pushed to the excess. Everything's not a crime. You know, everything's not corrupt. So it's, it's quite difficult uh, to, to get on top of it, and we're going to try to do that. So the first definition, this is just kind of review for you. Uh, this comes from uh, uh, Professor Leg Lessig has uh, uh, several related definitions. This is the one I'm, uh, a recent one, which is, you'll recognize, institutional corruption is manifest when a system, when a systematic and strategic influence is legal and even ethical, undermines the institution's effectiveness by diverting it from its purpose or weakening its ability to achieve its purpose, thereby weakening the public's trust in that institution or the institution's inherent trustworthiness. And, and of course, there are some notable features about, about, about this definition. There's the question of intent, intentionality or systematic you know, is organizational support. What we're interested in here is not, like if Stefan, excuse me, Stefan, but I mean, if you're a banker in Singapore and you're a one-off oddball crook, we're not interested in you here in this room, OK? Because it's not, you're not part of the institution. It's just a random kind of thing. What we're interested in is systematic, systematic behavior that has been supported in some way. There's this intentionality here uh, by the uh, organization or some group within the organization. Another notable feature of the Lessig definition is, I think this is a great phrase, the notion of magnetic deviation from institutional purpose, you know, under the influence of systematic and strategic influence. So when you talk about that with Congress, it's the same thing with firms as well. Uh, uh, this definition specifies conditions where inappropriate institutional dependencies develops. This is the whole notion of dependence corruption, you know, which you've all, you've all talked about uh, in this course. 
Uh, and then the other thing that's very interesting about this is, is, that, is that Larry uses both a private and public standards of corruption. It's both institutional performance and it's public trust. And you've got these things both working in that definition. And then there's neutrality regarding costs and benefits of corruption. One of the things Professor Lessig says, you know, this could be corrupt, but there may be some good things about it, you know, as well, which is kind of an interesting twist, you know, and, 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 and not twist, it's, it's actually central, you know, to his, to his definition. I have a slightly different one that I use. Uh, it, it's derivative, but I basically talk, when I'm talking about uh, uh, institutional corruption in the private sector, I'm basically referring to institutional corruption, uh, which is institutionally refers to institutionally supported behavior that, while not necessarily unlawful, erodes public trust in the offending company by undermining its perceived integrity and weakening its capacity to achieve its, its intent or, uh, uh, or its, um, its uh, espoused, espoused goals. Uh, just a word about integrity here, which uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the third line there, uh, it's so interesting. If you go and look at, uh, if you go and look at the annual reports or the 10Ks, these are reports, financial reports that are annually submitted to the SEC, and you, there's always in 85% of the companies in, in the U, New York Stock Exchange basically have a statement about what their espoused <laughs> values are. Integrity, 85% of them say integrity is the most important thing. So integrity is, sort of, is out there, uh, and uh, it's certainly commonly advertised. Uh, now, there are four forms of institutional corruption in business today that I, wanna, that I tend to focus on, and I've been worrying about for a long time. One is gaming society's rules of the game. And the more that you game, you go, you begin to, you begin to erode public trust, and you begin to also weaken your own organization's capacity to achieve its, its intent. Tolerating conflicts of interest, which I think you probably talked about last week, where, you know, in blind spots, and, and Max, you know, talked about that. Persist persistently violating norms of fairness. And this is where the level of executive pay comes in, as well as the structure. You know, how much is too much, which is an interesting thing here. And then cronyism, which is basically trying to get the government to to favor your business so that your success is dependent on the government rather than on your own, you know, on your own, on your own performance. And this retains the notions of intentionality and, mag and magnetic deviation. Uh, it's both public and private. It's, however, it's not neutral regarding costs and benefits of corruption. Basically, I think it's all bad. And, that, and, and, uh, and it views reform as a matter of corporate governance. And what I mean by corporate governance is not board of directors. But what I mean by corporate government is how you govern the firm. Govern comes from the Greek word to steer. It's how the board of directors and the top management of the firm decides to manage the shop. What are the internal rules of the game? How do you measure performance? How do you reward performance? Who has designated decision rights? How do you control decision rights? That's what this is all about. Okay. Now it's a practical matter. Both Professor Leg uh, Lessig and I talk about public trust, but in the private sector, how do you measure, pro how do you measure public, uh, public trust and firm reputation? How do you think you do it? How do you think? I, what you, I'm sorry, your name? Dan. Dan. Yeah. Okay, Dan, how do you measure this? Surveys. surveys. Okay, right on. So let's look at some surveys, okay? <laughs> uh, so it's very difficult, a diverse set of stakeholders influenced by ill-informed, open by, okay. How do we know it's driving? A clear violation of law, pretty, uh, okay. here are all the things that could be, okay. But how do we know? There are so many surveys out there, Dan. You and I would have a field day together if we could spend an afternoon, you know, looking at this. I'll give you a few of them. Okay, trust in institutional leaders. Are these numbers high or low, Dan? Pretty low. Are they very low? Yeah, yeah, okay, they're very low. So this trust thing, okay. Trust in CEOs as credible spokesmen. And this is, it has to do with they've served the informed public versus the general public. What uh, uh, What's informed public? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it, it, these are proxies for the informed. <laughs> 
Basically what they've done is survey executives who have, have a certain level of education and income. And they assume that that correlates with being informed. <laughs> okay. okay. Then you look at trust to do the right thing in selected industries. Technology's high. Pharmaceuticals is pretty high, given the bad <laughs> press that they get. Banks and financial services, pretty low. How much confidence you have in banks and financial institutions in general? Pretty low. How common do you think, uh, uh, corp uh, think corruption is in banks and financial is pretty high? Uh, OK, you get the idea, uh, Dan. There's a lot of information. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information out here on, uh, on, uh, on, on, on trust. But uh, behind these stats, Dan, is a rogues gallery of institutions that have disgraced themselves in recent years. I'll just tick off the ones that I remembered when I was sitting at my computer. WorldCom, Adelphi, Global Crossing, Health South, Sunbeam, Xerox, Bausch & Loam, Symbol Technologies, Ahold, that's the uh, Dutch company that owns Stop and Shop. Uh, Palmer Lab, Italian company, sells milk for babies. Tyco, that was the $50,000 toilet seats, uh, and more. News Corp, Sears, Citigroup, Goldman, JP Morgan, Countryside, Washington Mutual, Royal Bank of Scotland, Lloyds, Deutsche Bank, Glasso, Smith Klein, Merck, J and J. Just to mention, these are the ones that pop to mind. Plus. Plus, hundreds, hundreds of companies that have been forced in the last 18 months to restate their earnings, and plus those that have had to restake backdated stock option <coughs> grants dates, uh, including those for Steve Jobs before he died, so they get a bigger run up, you know, in the price of the stock. So there's a lot behind here of real companies that have been in this. Okay. So the management of public trust. You got the definitions, and you see one of the tests is public trust. There's a lot out there in public trust. Now, there's one, as I said, there, there are a few forms of, uh, there are a few important forms uh, that I want to take a, 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 of, 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 of institutional corruption in the private sector. And one is gaming. It's one of those four that I, that I mentioned. And it's, it's one that's particularly, it's one that's particularly uh, difficult. It refers to behavior that sidesteps or bypasses established rules of the game in order to get per gain personal advantage without resorting to blatantly illegal acts. So gamers use their knowledge, which is often superior to that of legislators or their contractual partners, to take unintended and difficult to foresee advantages of the law. And gaming obviously is rational when the gains from gaming are higher than the cost of gaming, like getting cost, for example. And uh, gaming becomes a leading form of institutional corruption when such institutionally supported behavior either subverts the intent of society's rules and regulations, antitrust, SEC, accounting, whatever it would be, uh, law, uh, un undermines the offending institution's public reputation and trustworthiness and compromises its espoused goals and values, like in the Citigroup example that I use to start off my paper. Uh, gaming takes place in situations where the returns for sidestepping the rules are high. And that's in tax law, securities law, accounting. All that's just fertile grounds uh, uh, for that. So you can say, OK, gaming. And you could be cynical. And you could say, uh, you look, hey, finance is yet to meet a rule it doesn't want to game. I would add to that, mankind has yet to meet a rule that it doesn't want to game. We all game, you know, one way, uh, you know, one way or, uh, or another. And there are two ways in the private sector, anyway, that we game. There are two kind of games, actually. There is the rule writing game, which is an influence game, which is the games that you've been talking about right here, which actually has to do with all the lobbying that goes on to write rules with exclusions and loopholes that in the future sometime, you can then drive through with a Chevy truck, okay? And that's sort of, that's an influence game. 
And then there is a compliance game, or the rule following game, which is actually driving your truck through the loophole sometime you know, in, the, uh, you know, in, the, uh, in the in 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 the future now i'll give you an example of those here's a here's a, a rule uh, rule making game so you're probably all aware of the vocal rule which is 619 of the uh, you know of the uh, of the financial reform act of uh, 2010 and what that basically says the vocal rule named after a former chairman of the federal reserve is that proprietary trading is out and market making it in and okay. What proprietary trading means is you can't trade federally insured depositors' money, okay, for the house account. In other words, if I'm a partner at J.P. Morgan or if I'm a partner at Goldman Sachs, but particularly J.P. Morgan, I cannot use depositors' money, which is guaranteed by the government, to make trades which will make profits for the firm, which as a partner, I then put it in my pocket or could lose. Okay, but market making for clients is, is appropriate. And the real problem is, of course, you can't tell the difference in many cases for reasons I can tell you. The difference between, it's hard at, 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 in many respects to, to, tell those, to tell those differences. So an example would be, you know, this one, here's, here's a good, that's what the vocal rule is about. But here's a clear case of, 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 uh, of rule making game. J.P. Morgan lobbied for U.S. banks to be permitted under the Volcker Rule to conduct proprietary trading of equities as long as the risks are taken in their foreign banking entities. This exclusion allows J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley City to compete fully with the foreign brethren. That's how it was justified. All American banks need to do is to locate their trading decisions inside their British, German, and French operations and hold their securities there. And my conclusion to all of this, and I've said it today, and you can write it down it, that, that this exclusion is, is most likely to lead to the next financial meltdown. This is a huge exclusion because it just moves this, all this stuff, all this proprietary trading, which is excluded in the United States abroad. So that's a good example. Now, here's a prepaid transaction one. Uh, and I'm going to kind of move quickly because there's a lot to do here. But uh, 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 so here. You've got to understand this. I, I know this is, you know, most of you who haven't been in business and finance, this is going to look strange. But let's just muscle through it, because if you can understand this one, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So I need a volunteer, OK? Uh, we've got Dan, we've got Stefan who volunteered. Uh, I need someone. Has anybody ever worked on Wall Street in this room? Ah, I'm so good. What's your name? I'm sorry. Uh, Maria. Maria. OK, Maria. Good, good, good. So here's some facts, Maria. <laughs> Enron was always short of cash. So Enron asked banks to cover its current cash needs by prepaying for oil and gas that it would deliver in the future. OK? You get that. OK, they want the cash in, and I'll give you oil and gas you know, back in the, in, 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 in the future. Now, neither party incurred any material price risk, Maria because they entered into swap agreements that effectively transferred the price risk of oil and gas contracts to third parties. In other words, nobody in this transaction had any price risk at all. Okay. So after Enron goes bankrupt, its creditors, I mean, this was a $60 billion collapse in three days. Okay, and the Department of Justice claims that in the absence of any price and credit risk to Enron, the prepays could not be deemed to be a sales transaction generating cash from <coughs> operations. So this is an interesting subpoint of accounting. This is why accounting is so interesting, all of you who are wondering why it's so boring, because it's not. Because in fact, what happens is a sale is not a sale and cannot be recorded as a sale if, in fact, you have a buy-sell transaction, in quote, where the risk of owning that asset doesn't switch. Unless risk switches, there's no sale. And you can't, you can't recognize that payment in as cash. OK. So, uh, so then what the DOJ, uh, Department of Justice, claimed is that, in fact, they were borrowing money short term, OK, without recording it as such. So the balance sheet looked better. And they were misrepresenting the cash flow status of the company. So those are the facts okay, Maria, of, of, of the case. Now, question, Maria, for you. A 
assuming that these swap agreements were, were, were adequately and properly accounted for in footnotes to the financial statements, which they were, is there any corruption involved? Yeah, it depends exactly how you define corruption. And we have defined corruption, you know, as, as behavior which is not necessarily unlawful, but never leads to the diminution of trust in the institution. This case went to court in the UK, the highest commercial court, because one of the counterparties was National Westminster Bank, Nat West, which was acquired by Barclays. You don't care about that. Okay, testimony was like this. They basically said, no foul. Because each of, the, each of the swap transactions were accurately accounted for. <coughs> That's outrageous. There was a total misrepresentation of, of, of the financial condition of the company you know, under these swaps. Now, in this country, if this were in a tax court, you know, and uh, Larry, you could correct me on this, but in a tax court, you know, even if you've reported everything perfectly in multiple transactions, but the intent of the transactions perfectly reported are to defraud the government, you're still liable. Okay, so this is something in one regime, you know, that this is a perfect example of the kind of, you know, running around, you know, the rules of the game to make things better. And when you begin to hear about this, it gets reported out, people say, doesn't smell good. Okay. <laughs> So, uh, and by the way, a lot of banks have been doing it. So one of the things that retired professors do is that they make lists. And this is a list of all the bank compliance games and fines from 2009 to 2013, okay, which is $30 billion, okay, in fines. And if you include in, with the signs the settlements to pay out to injured parties, it's $90 billion. So... How does it all happen? And here's my hypothesis, very simply, which is that about how, what's happening now that's different from later is that the basic hypothesis, and I'm not going to repeat everything that's in the paper because you can read it yourself, the shorter the time period for measuring individual and organizational performance and the larger of the rewards and penalties tied to these measures, the greater the incentives for executives to pursue personal gain at the expense of their company's reputation, its spouse values, and intended strategy. And Stefan, that was the discussion that you and I just had. There was a hypothesis, implicit hypothesis embedded in what you were saying. Here it is in formal language. Okay. Now, here's the other point that I would make is that since top management is ultimately responsible for the design and regulation of executive sentence, uh, they are complicit in the corrupt behavior of executives with delegated decision rights. <laughs> And, uh, and I can go into why I think so with Goldman and with J.P. Morgan and London Whale, but I'll come back to that later if there's an interest. Now, there may be other explanations compatible with short-termism story. Uh, there's a noble corruption story, you know, which basically is people do, good people do bad things, you know, because somehow it's noble. Uh, I suggest if you, for those of you who are writers, go see, uh, go see the, uh, the, uh, there's an interesting book out just out called uh, The Armstrong Lie. You know how now Neil Armstrong, you know, justifies, you know, his his behavior. Uh, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, there's uh, Lloyd Blankfein at Goldman Sachs, uh, who is actually a very very smart guy, uh, and uh, and and there the, the the whole question is what we're doing here is noble. You know, we're doing God's work. Uh, I will. I'm not going to talk about the God's work at Goldman Sachs. Uh, there's some good examples of that. There's a book out on this if you want to if you want to read it called What Happened to Goldman Sachs by Stephen Mandis, uh, who is a, a guy who worked for Goldman Sachs. He didn't make part, he left before he made partner. He set up his own investment shop, sold it for gazillions of dollars, then went to McKinsey to become a sort of, not because he needed the money, but because he wanted to do it, uh, advising financial institutions. He's just completing his PhD in sociology at Columbia in his lecture at Columbia Business School. Very interesting guy, and uh, you can see, you can, you can see this, uh, you can see this noble corruption, noble cause corruption, uh, as described by Steve uh, Steve uh, uh, Mandis. Uh, 
So here the question is, well, what are the sources of short-termism and the corruption it invites? And here I'm going to quick, I'm going to go through some things that are pretty well explained in the paper. And uh, I'm just going to put these out here and uh, quickly, because I don't want to repeat what's in the paper. But there, there's, there's something, two things that are really important going on here that I just want to accent. And that is, for those of you who are studying economics know about the theory of the firm. Well, a theory of the firm is sort of a metaphor. There's a lot of mathematics and there's a lot of stuff, but it's a metaphor for thinking about the firm as an organization. How do you think about the firm? Same with anything else. How do you think about a marriage? How do you think about a friendship? There are many metaphors you know, for thinking about that. And basically, a theory of the firm is one highly developed you know, set of metaphors about it. There are two. There's, there's sort of, a, there's sort of a, 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 what I would call sort of the traditional legal view of the corporation, which is that the corporation is a trust. The corpus of that trust is the corporation itself, and the, tr and, and the directors are the trustees of that. And they have a lot of discretion for a variety of reasons as to how they set you know, the goals of the organization. There's a competing one in the last 25 years, which is an economic view of the corporation, which is as an artifact of private contract and property rights. And uh, this is well spelled out in the paper. This is sort of a contractarian view of the firm, which is that basically, you know, a firm is created when you take all those buy-sell contracts that are bilateral outside the firm and you put them in a hierarchy. And so a firm is think, thought of as a nexus of contracts. Now, if you love that view of an organization as a net ver ne nexus of contracts rather than of living people, uh, good luck, okay? But there are a lot of people who believe this and they probably have the stronger hand right now. Uh, but what's so interesting about this is that what, 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 what basically happens to this is that this theory of the firm, which is that basically you put all these contracts in the firm and you make it a hierarchy, is that, that what the managers of these firms have to do over and over again is reduce the coordination costs of managing those contracts in the firm and those relationships in the firm. And the way of doing it, again, is to give the incentives which are interested in the people who own this firm. Okay, And the only way you can do that is, again, tie performance back to financial measures you know, of performance, which basically financializes the whole notion of the firm rather than a human organization with a more rich set of goals. And, uh, <clears throat> and so this has been, this has been a, a conflict over a period of time. So much so, because it suggests that the goals of the firm are, 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 are very different. The second one, the economic view of the corporation, it is always, it's maximization. It's value maximization. Okay, this is over what time period, but it's value maximization, where for the former, it's a much more different view of the firm. So that when last, in 2012, when I was doing my interviewing at Citigroup, and when the vice, I spent oh, a whole day with the vice chairman of the Citigroup, and uh, a terrific guy, you know, former Wall Street lawyer and a lot of banking experience, at the end of the day when he's trying to clean up the whole mess, the Citigroup looked at me, and he said, Malcolm, he said, you know, where's True North? What are we trying to maximize? Well, if he's confused, everybody's confused, you know, uh, about that. So you've got these competing views of the firm, okay, which is one source of the short-termism, particularly because the latter view, which seems to be dominant, basically has financialized the firm. And then you've got the rise of a new financial culture, where everything is transactional, the ascent of trading, in, uh, of traders in O-line banks. All the O-line banks are run by traders rather than by investment bankers. Uh, the, the, cha the, the, the changed uh, time horizons of fund managers, portfolio turnover rates, uh, facilitating technologies. Uh, the Bank of England has pointed out uh, in its reports that uh, in the 1970s, uh, the holding period for securities across all investor groups uh, in 1970s was seven years. It's now seven months. And that's actually, uh, that's actually not totally accurate in the sense that hedge funds, which now control, which now ac uh, account for 50% of the transactions in the market, so hold their securities for minutes. That's short-termism. This, this is the whole short-term uh, short culture. And then you've got the quarterly guidance uh, business, which is uh, 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 the earnings guidance business, which you have to wear 
companies because of new legislation are allowed to kind of project their earnings for the next quarter. Guess what? Once you project your earnings for the next quarter, you make them because you get killed by the market if you don't, if you miss them by a penny. Okay. So this is driving the short-termism. Uh, you've got misapplied performance metrics, which I talk about you know, in the paper. And basically, as you go from subjective to objective performance measures, it means you can game them much more. Uh, I have a whole riff in there about, about the problem of performance me metrics based on the, uh, on the productivity of capital. I, I, I suggest you look at that and why that invites short-termism. Then you've got, of course, the structure of pay and the level, uh, and the, and the level of pay that we have, uh, we have talked about. And, uh, and there, by the structure of pay, what I'm talking about is what's the time period of measurement and what's the types of rewards and what's the link between performance and measures. And in the little example that Stefan and I had, you know, we had short time period, big payoff. That's going to affect behavior. That's structure, basically, is what I'm, uh, is what I'm talking about. Okay, and then our vulnerability, the hardwired behavioral biases. There's a ton of stuff in brain science going on that I talk about in the paper that kind of encourages, uh, that leads us to kind of uh, short time horizons, a shrinking of time horizons. And of course, we've got the decreasing tenure of institutional leaders. Uh, you know, CEOs are getting fired more and more and quicker and quicker. And then the bounded knowledge of corporate directors. The people who are supposed to be responsible for firms know less and less about more and more you know, as the firms grow. McKinsey just did a study that showed that only like 11% of the samples of public companies that they looked at, the directors said they really understood the risks that the company was facing. You can't run a company like that, you know, with that kind of basis. So that means everything is kind of, let's do it quickly, and let's get the results out as quickly as possible. And to curb it, you know, do you want more rules? Do you want all of this? And I'm talking about playing the long game here. Uh, on the rules, Again, looking at the clock, I, want to, uh, I just want to say that, that there have been a bunch of new rules in Europe you know, with respect to compensation. They've all been run around. They've all been run around in the last month. And for those of you who want to talk about that, I can do that after, after class. Uh, and, and the objectives you know, of this long game is basically you know, sustaining high levels of, of integrity, curbing the short-termism, restoring the public trust, all these things. You know, which are part of the definitions. And, and what are the essential policies and practices? Uh, it depends how you frame them, and I'm not going to go through that right now. Uh, but basically, the covered corporate governance measures relate to technical things, expanding directors' oversight capabilities. I write about that. And then fixing the perverse incentives. This is a real problem, which is fixing this, this uh, the, the, our new uh, economy of, of, uh, of, uh, of influence and economy of incentives, which is where I started you know, in the talk. And that has to do with de-emphasizing long-term capital productivity measures, lengthening the duration of performance metrics, extended payout periods of bonus rewards, extended periods for unwinding stock options, tying stock-based compensation to above average returns, requiring senior executives to have skin in the game, assist on purchase accountability with the clawback of bonuses. So that what that means, Stefan, in our case, you know, if I'm awarding you some, if I'm awarding you some, uh, some stock bonuses, first of all, the question is, if the question is, for what time period of performance are we awarding that? How long do you have to own, own them before you can exercise them? I guarantee that if I ask, sorry, that if I ask you, <laughs> that if I ask you, that if I ask you to hold on to those, you can't exercise those options for 10 years, you're going to have a whole different view. My view of, my, what my view is on this, which I argue is, I'm happy to make you independently wealthy if you create real money and real, va excuse me, real value, but you don't cash out for 10 years or until you retire. That's fine. That's like Bill Gates, okay? I have nothing, I have nothing against you being independently wealthy, but not over a period like this. Over a period like that is a whole is a whole uh, is a whole different is a whole different arg arg argument. And plus the fact, how do you evaluate? You know, how do you evaluate? You know, how much money you've made with your style, how, how much value has been created with the options that you hold? Most of them are naked options. It's ridiculous. What if the whole market goes up? You know, and you're just riding. All boats are going up together, and then you get paid because the market's going up. Time out. 
that's not creating value. So it's got to be indexed to what the market is doing or to some cohort group. If you outperform them, terrific. I'm happy for you. And you want to be happy too. So there are the incentive problems. You've got, the, you've got to end this earnings guidance. The decision audits that are important. And there's some public policy measures, which I think are important, which I point out in the, in, the K, in, the, in, the, in the article. My soapbox is tax reform. We're all talking about tax reform. And this is the one that will not play very well in this room, I don't think, but I believe it, which is you know that the long-term capital gains tax you know, is 15%. And that's below the normal tax, 25%, 20 to 25, 25%. Do you know what the definition of long term is? What do you think? 366 days. One year. On 366 days, the tax rate drops. OK, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. This one is long term, 366 days. It's crazy. OK, so anyway, I argue in my paper, what we need to do is basically have a, a, a we need to have a, a capital gains tax, which actually drops to zero over 60 months. You hold something for five years, or some other politically acceptable level, at the same time that you institute the Buffett rule, which is over a certain level of income, you got to pay a minimum of 35% tax or whatever that tax, progressive at some, at, at, at some level. So, you know, uh, I haven't made much progress with this yet, but I'm working on it. And so just for two final things, and I'm not, I'm not even going to show you the slides. Two final things. We know how to curb short-termism, but it's not being done. There's some sort of a collective action problem here. So the question is, what is the, what is the source of that, and how do we deal with it? Uh, one of the problems that I'd like to leave you with is the problem of lawyers and accountants and their role and their self-image. If the role of a lawyer, of a tax lawyer or a transaction lawyer or an accountant is basically to maximize the interests of the client, go to the mat, wrestle the sucker down to the, you know, to the ground, Squeeze everything you can out without violating, you know, the law, even though you may subvert the intent of the law. If it's really kind of continually, you know, testing the outer limits to see what you can do for your clients, that's very different from a view of a lawyer who says, yes, we got to serve the client or an accountant, but there's some responsibility to the profession. And where that balance is is not clear. Where that balance, and I know they talk a lot about this at the law school. Uh, as well. But this is a really complicated question because if we execute all this stuff that we think we know about, but still the advisors are pushing their clients you know, to, the, to, the, to the extremes, then the gaming will persist forever. So I'm going to stop there. I think I have to stop uh, here, as a, as, a, uh, as a matter of fact. But that gives you a flavor, a little bit of the flavor of what, of what uh, institutional corruption looks like. In the, in, the, in the private sector, the kinds of things that we can do to, to curb it, but also ends with the question, it's not being done. And the question is, why? And that's something that uh, I've been working on for 52 years. And guess what, guys? It's your turn. Yeah. <laughs>